Delegations. Sue Kenny. Sorry, oh, oh it's Dale. <laughs> Dale Bones said South Peace Health uh, Society, Boultry uh, Community House Update. Dale? Thank you, Your Worship, and to Council staff. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. It's an honor to be here in the District of Chetland's uh, beautiful facility, and uh, it's good to see. Um, some of my old friends. Uh, it's an equally an honor to be here on the traditional territory of Treaty 8, uh, the Slavey, the Sikini, the Dunnies, the Beaver, the Cree, and the Soto people. Uh, that traditional unceded territory is an honor to be here uh, on their territory today and every day. And we thank them uh, for um, giving us that opportunity. I wanted to come today uh, to be able to give an update to council and the community on the uh, South Peace Health Services Society and in particular, the Bolter Ice House. The Society uh, formed, was formed a number of years ago as an initiative by uh, the mayors and councils of uh, the South Peace, along with the Peace River Regional uh, District uh, Area Directors, uh, D&E. And it was really intended to be an initiative to help us support the um, recruitment, retention, and healthcare services uh, in the region. One of the initiatives that came as a result of that was the Bolter Ice Patient Accommodation House. And it was a patient accommodation house that would allow uh, for us to be able to help support and assist residents from the region who may be going into Dawson Creek for acute care services or other medical services to be able to have an affordable uh, place to stay while they're uh, seeking that medical care. Uh, obviously, the uh, society has went through its uh, real trials and tribulations over the last four years in terms of trying to get their uh, feet under them. Uh, the project uh, took place, the uh, Bolter Ice Clinic, which was uh, Dr. Bolter Ice, the OBGYN uh, for the region, uh, had his clinic just a block away from the hospital. Uh, unfortunately, he um, passed away uh, a, a few years ago and the clinic was sitting empty and it created the opportunity for us to be able to develop this six room patient accommodation. Um, as I say, the society was formed uh, as a grassroots society represented by people from across the region, uh, Chetland, uh, Tumbler Ridge, Puskupi Dawson, and the rural areas. And uh, really did, once the renovations got underway, really struggled in terms of being able to get to the completion stage, the execution of getting it uh, finished. Uh, in De September of 2021, the board of the society at that time all resigned en masse. Uh, this is the, the renovation project was at a place where it was probably at about $400,000, $450,000 it was going to take to complete it. Uh, so it was in a big hole. It really was struggling. And the board were, I think, worried about their own personal liabilities and being involved in a project uh, and in a volunteer society like that. And so they all resigned en masse. There were a number of us that were still members of the society, and so um, we called and were able to get enough of us to call an extraordinary meeting, uh, annual general meeting, at which time we had a new board elected. I was elected as the president of the board uh, because it is something that's so, so passionate about in terms of healthcare services. I think for our region is uh, just critical in my view, and so I stepped in and we were able to then get the society back on its feet. 
Uh, we applied for a grant through Northern Development Initiative Trust of $300,000 that we were successful on in February of March of 2022. We then secured some other grant funding and um, got the contract completion scheduled at about $450,000. Uh, we, we went then and got the construction completed. Um, as construction was going on, then the board started to anticipate opening and operating it. And so we met with a few local organizations to get a sense of what that was going to be. And the complexities then of operating a facility seven days a week, 24 hours a day hit us kind of right between the eyes. It was really onerous in terms of what uh, that looked like. So we reached out to the Minister of Health um, and I had a meeting with Stephen Brown, the deputy, and uh, we had a discussion about this facility and being at a, it's a regional facility. It's one that provides uh, support and accommodation to people from the entire Northeast of British Columbia, including the Northern Rockies. And so the minister um, and the ministry agreed that they saw the benefit of that and agreed to fund it and they're funding the operation of it. So we were able to then facilitate an agreement with the Dawson Creek Society for Community Living who operate facilities in our community for, I think they have an excess of 100 uh, rooms that they provide accommodation for residents, disabled adults, et cetera. And so they now have the capacity, the expertise, the competencies to effectively operate it. And so we've now got an agreement and a contract with them to be able to operate the facility. So that was kind of one more off our plate. Once we got the, um, uh, construction renovations finished. We went about furnishing it. Again, there's forty or fifty thousand dollars it took to furnish the uh, Boltrace house, and we got that done. When the house was purchased, the board at the time got a loan, a mortgage from the Lakeview Credit Union, for uh, three hundred thousand dollars in order to purchase the facility. So they were making annual payments of about seventy thousand dollars a year, and so uh, the, through the Peace River Regional District, through some funding that the region had available, the board. Uh, last fall, agreed to pay the mortgage off for us. And so that uh, eliminated $180,000 of obligation that we were as fundraisers trying to find a way to uh, pay off. And so now today we're in the situation where we have an agreement to operate it. We have the construction completed. We have no liabilities at all with respect to the uh, facility itself. And so we had the grand opening uh, last week and um, it is open, it is available. It's got six bedrooms, four, I think four and a half baths. Three of the rooms are fully wheelchair accessible with two fully wheelchair accessible bathrooms. Uh, and it's very, very, it's a very appropriate facility for somebody who's looking to go in for now maternity or surgery or oncology treatment. A resident from District of Tumbler Ridge now going in for two nights because they got to go in a couple of days ahead for chemo treatments or whatever. Now they have an affordable place to stay that's really modern and clean. And it's really a very, very appropriate place to go and stay. And so we're really proud of uh, where it's at today and, and um, really ecstatic to be in the position where we are, that we've got it completed and finished and open and, and now move forward with some of those initiatives that we wanted to take on originally around healthcare recruitment and retention and things like that. So um, from that perspective, the Bolt Rights Patient Accommodation House is open, it is available. And so we've, we're getting it out through the Southeast Division of Family Practice, as well as the other uh, physicians, so that they're aware of it, as well as into the community through Northern Health and through different community organizations, so that people are aware of it. Uh, the re for the residents in the region now, they can access it and have it available. Um, there are two other things I just really want to talk about very, very quickly is uh, the uh, recruitment aspect. And so we're working with the city of Dawson Creek. They have a house in Dawson that uh, we've taken on. So we now have taken over that facility and we're providing locum accommodation for the locums that come into town. So now we have a two room uh, home uh, that we've taken on and have got that available. We got the dealerships in town that have both provided us with two vehicles. So the locums, when the visiting locums come in, the anesthesiologists, the specialists, the physicians now, they have a vehicle and a place to stay when they come to the community. So that's just, we're just trying to build that reputation from the region that we're, one that we're working hard about healthcare and recruitment of healthcare professionals and make it conducive to be able to make it an attractive region for folks to want to come to. 
Um, and at the, I should add at the Bull Trace house, there was a carriage house added to the property, a two room, and that's being used by Northern Health for agency nurses. So they have a place to stay. So we couldn't do this, honestly, it's a bit of partnership, man. We could not have done it without the core, core support and partnership from the regional district and the communities. And I just, uh, today it was just about getting out back out into the communities and giving an update on what we're doing and where it's at and how successful I think we have demonstrated we can be working at a community level to support the healthcare, uh, delivery of healthcare services in our region. And we're the only, the only two things I would think about as I was coming into town was we really need some, some more board members. And, and the benefit of us having somebody from chat one on the board to be able to make those connections to your health services, to the uh, hospital foundation and to the healthcare providers and to the community, we identify, we understand then what are needed in the community and we can work together collaboratively, proactively on some of those issues that are so important to the community. So anybody that has a, in, in, any information on potential people who might be interested in serving on the board, we'd love to have some representation from Chapman. Um, and the other thing I was, I was thinking about when I came into town was uh, the amazing job that the District of Chapman have done with the chainsaw carving. And so at, I know that those move out into the community. Dawson Creek's been a recipient of one of them or two of them, I think. And so if at some point uh, there was uh, the thoughts about maybe moving one out, I'd love to have one at the Bull Trace House. I would love to have one on that property to demonstrate that partnership and the pride of community and the pride of the partnership with the district of Chatwan. So um, thank you so much. Kines Compton, I thank you for uh, giving me some time today to come and give a bit of an update to you guys. And again, we we could not do this without the partnership. And so Chatwan, district of Chatwan, district of Tumbler Ridge, Kuskupi, the regional district have been instrumental and that support at the regional level to get us to get the project completed. And, and it's very, very strong. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Yep, uh, I can ask of Jim Dale, thanks for that. Any questions from council? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I might have uh, a couple of questions. So. Thanks so much, Dale. Like, what a wonderful project that all the communities and the piece have contributed to, and I think it'll be very successful. Um, are you, you are the current president? Yeah. Okay, so your, I think your your website need, needs a bit updating. We we got locked out of the old website, and so we built a new one. Okay. And so the old one should be down shortly, and but we can't we can't access it, we can't get into it, and we can't. Uh, so we built a new one, and there is a new website up and running now. Okay, so so SP the, SP Health Services, oh, I think. Okay, so I'm a, I'm on the old one. Thank yeah. you for that. Glad I asked. Um, so, besides going to the website, how does a potential patient find out about it? So that's why we're trying to get the message out, uh, Councillor Work, in terms of uh, how people have access to it. There is a link on our website under the Bolter Ice House, and there's a patient registration form there through the Dots Creek Society of Community Living. And we've got it out to the docs as well so that they know as well that they'll have that link as well. We're just we're just trying to do that promotion now of getting the message out for people. And the registration can be done electronically online and you fill out the referral form. It goes to the Society for Community Living and there's an on-site manager who then will take it and manage the referral. Sounds really good. I'll uh, I'll look at that website and then share that information. And I love the idea of uh, possibly having one of our carvings at the location. So yeah. thanks again. Thank you. You know, I think it'd be honestly. I th you know, it's coming in, and I always love the carvings. And and uh, I think what if wouldn't that be a cool piece at the Bolter Ice House, right? Mel. Okay. So I started on the South Peace Health Services Society back probably about like five and a half years okay. ago um, and with one of the council members from here as well. And it was uh, quite a unique experience. I unfortunately had to leave um, yeah. when I was having a baby. Uh, so it was a sad departure from the society. Uh, it would be something that I'd consider 
uh, starting again because recruitment and retention of health services professionals in our communities is extremely important yeah. and whatever I can do to support. So it'd be something I would consider. Awesome. Um, how many, like, do you guys run the Bull Tree House yourselves or do you have staffing in the facility? We, we were able to, because the province were agreeing that they would help us fund it. So then we signed an agreement with a contract with the Dawson Creek Society for Community Living. Mm-hmm. And so they have that expertise. They operate facilities now and they operate housing. So, so they're going to operate the facility on our behalf and they'll have a staff there and they'll operate it seven days a week, 24 hours a day and um, under an agreement with us. And then we just report the information back to the ministry. And same with the, they, they'll do the two beds for the nurses too. So we signed a separate lease with Northern Health for that. They wanted to have access to that for the agency nurses. Okay. And so we've just leased that to Northern Health. And that just helps us with some revenue coming in to pay utilities and different things like that. But if you're interested, um, for sure, we'd love to have more representation uh, on the board from Chowan and absolutely would welcome the uh, support. Absolutely. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Uh, one of the things uh, I was uh, worried about and being a patient, if I was, uh, I have somebody there, is their relations to the new hospital. What's that going to look like? Uh, do you have an idea of what the track would be from the Moultrie House to the new hospital? Yeah, Alan, sorry, Mayor Couture, it's it's about a block from the old hospital to the Moultrie House now. The cool part about where the new hospital is going to be built on the corner of the Northern Lights College, it's still probably only about a block or block and a half block down. Uh, instead of going south uh, to the hospital, now you'll go east to the hospital from the Boltrice House. Still very, very conducive. That's why we really like the location, just because it was so accessible to the hospital for, you know, somebody coming in and they're not, you know, you're sick and you, you know, you, it's tough then if you're trying to get a ride or you're not from town. So this is an easy, easy walk. Absolutely. And Dale, uh, some of the stuff when people ask me uh, uh, the question of, is this something like a Ronald McDonald house, right? That's the question. Yeah. So it's exactly like that, uh, Mayor Cotre. It's a Ronald McDonald house. And so a patient that comes in would pay, like the resident would pay $30 a night to stay there. And we subsidize the, the balance through uh, donations and all, as well through the ministry. So it's exactly that. It's a Ronald McDonald house. And one last thing uh, we did in our budget, uh, I think in 2019. And if I'm correct on uh, donating some computers for for the house itself or wherever you guys want to put them in the in, on the property yeah. is fine with us. And one of the other things that we were thinking, well, I was thinking when when this was done years ago, uh, they have immediate families that come with them, right? So there's systems out there that uh, maybe I, I know some other communities have donated uh, uh, dollars. So us being uh, a community where we don't have as much as uh, more uh, as others, I, I think uh, game systems that might be conducive to uh, the immediate family because if you're there, if you're watching TV, and you know today the kids don't have the opportunity to bring their own gaming system, uh, brother, sister, or even the patient mm-hmm. themselves need need something other than just the computer that uh, we we're looking at. So. Uh, that'll something that uh, maybe later on okay. our, we will think about that and uh, do maybe a possibility of that because it was 2000, I believe, 19, uh, Kevin, if we, when we made, we passed that, uh, that we were going to donate five uh, computers. I think, honestly, the uh, cool part about where we're at today is now with the um, ministry helping fund the operations, they've taken some of that pressure off of us and equipment and all of those things. Uh, but we are going to furnish one of the rooms downstairs. It's a spare room right now into a bit of a games room for the kids and mm-hmm. and toys and stuff. But maybe if we just put that on the side and maybe we'll leave it for six months to see what traffic looks like for patients and guests who are coming in to stay and see what some of those needs are. And maybe we'll come back and do a follow-up presentation to council um, maybe in the fall. It's okay, here's some of the needs now we've identified because we're really operating a facility that's we're brand new. We have no idea what to expect. Um, and then we, we still, we cert, certainly don't know what to expect with families and 
it's conducive to a patient, somebody coming in, but it, the rooms are all one room, one bed. And so we're going to probably make a deal with one of the hotels as well to say, look, if we have a family come in, it might be more conducive to put them into a hotel where it's a little more spacious for them, et cetera. So, so I think honestly, if we could just leave that and we appreciate the support and we appreciate the input and if we can give it like three months or six months. So we understand what the traffic is and what kind of demands are on it. And then maybe, maybe there's some things that we can do that we could come to the district for some support on. Yeah, thank you, Dale. Thank you so much. Can I ask Compton? Very good information, thank you. Okay, next delegation, Sue Kenny, Community Futures, PCR. Good afternoon. First of all, um, I'm not the community person. Probably unplugged it too, if I know. <laughs> so first of all, on behalf of our Community Futures, uh, we acknowledge Treaty 8 territory, the ancestral traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, and Métis people, and we recognize the land as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on and do business. Uh, so, uh, thank you for um, fitting me into your, your council meeting. I know that... Um, it was kind of a, a, a rush. I put a uh, Fran, my uh, regional business liaison, I put her to work to schedule uh, council meetings uh, right across uh, the Northeast. <laughs> and she was quick, <laughs> like she had it done in a week. <laughs> she is a keeper, that's for sure. <laughs> so I, I sent a, a PowerPoint, and, uh, and because Fran was so quick, I didn't really get a chance to <laughs> update um, update it completely, but we'll, um, we'll start with it. To, uh, anyway, I'm Sue Kenny, I'm general manager for, for Community Futures. I've been uh, an employee of Community Futures for 21 years now, and I was on the board of directors for five years prior to that. And I provided you some information because uh, I thought it was important um, to give you a background on Community Futures itself. And it's a separate document from the PowerPoint. And Community Futures uh, started in, in 1986. And so it kind of gives you a calendar of each year. Yeah. Uh, so I thought rather than read it to you, that you can read it on your own, <laughs> your own time at, at another date. But we've been around for a long time. There's 292 Community Futures across Canada. And uh, the Community Futures in, in uh, Peace Liard the Northeast was one of the first community futures that started up in the 1980s. Uh, oh, you really can't read this, eh? This is very bad. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I explained to her. So our local community future serves the regional district of Peace Lear, uh uh, Peace, Peace River Regional District, and so we're right. We start right from the border of the Mackenzie Regional District, and uh, we are also serve the uh, Fort Nelson Regional District, as far as up to Atlin, and then the Community Futures in Terrace. Uh, they from Atlin on, they they serve. You keep going to, off to the northwest. Uh, so uh, our mission is to, uh, we are locally, uh, we're a non-for-profit organization and we are, we're, we're governed by a board of directors. Uh, our board of directors represents uh, the communities that, that we work in. Uh, Naomi Larson is our, uh, is our chair, the chair of our board, and she has been the chair uh, this uh, two terms now. 
uh, so for four years. And she does an amazing job, and I have to tell you, she is a real champion for Chapman. <laughs> Your, your your voice is heard. And so so then Mike Wally uh, from Fort St. John, he is the vice chair and he is uh, and he re he's a representation from Fort St. John, but also uh, with his uh, experience uh, through the uh, Resource Municipalities Coalition, he's also a great representative that, ha that knows what's going on in all the communities. And uh, Lilia Hansen, she and her husband are business owners, and she, of course, you know, is currently the mayor of uh, Fort St. John. And uh, she was our export navigator advisor for the last four years. And it was a natural fit for Lilia to come back onto our board. She was on our board previously when she was on council for, for Fort St. John. And it wasn't because of her political position it was the, it was due to her uh, her particip her her involvement in the community, and she was a business owner, and so it had nothing to do with being uh, a counselor at the time. Uh, she was actually working for the Chamber of Commerce, and it had. I just want to know that. I just want you to know that. Um, don't feel slighted. <laughs> as a mayor and council that, that, that we have a mayor because and I can tell you that she's got a real regional hat on and speaks for everybody and as export navigator uh, when she was the export navigator advisor she traveled all over the northeast and gave everybody the same amount of uh, consideration and time and, and business support. And then we have Lori Archibald. Uh, uh, Lori's the CEO for Lakeview Credit Union. So we have another very um, uh, in touch with the region uh, board member, and that's why Lori sits on our board. And so she can speak to the whole South piece on, um, on what's happening with businesses and provide a voice at our, at our board. And Dustin Bonder Bonderick, he's uh, general manager for the event of uh, center, the, the uh, previously the Encana Event Center. He has a wealth of experience in marketing and business. And Jana Coleman, she's the executive director for the Nowican Friendship Center, and she represents, uh, represents uh, the uh, uh, First Nations, rural, urban uh, First Nations people. And that is our board at, at present. And uh, I did do another, I did do another, uh, I don't need to, uh, our staff is myself, general manager, Bonnie McLean, uh, you might have met her, and she's been in Chapman quite a bit, and she's our business analyst, so she's the one that takes care of the businesses, and then Tracy Mazeros takes care of our money and makes sure that we're doing every, uh, everything we're supposed to be doing, and also um, managing projects. And then uh, Joanna Finney, she is uh, our office manager. And so this is where I had uh, updated the, the uh, numbers on, uh, on our business loan program. This, uh, like a lot of this, this presentation was, was done for the 2019-2020 year. And so those were the numbers for that year. So when you look at the number of uh, the investment fund, 5,531,833, uh, uh, from our 2022, our last audited financial statements was done in March 2022, and we are now 10,504,143. Uh, and that, uh, that number grew from the $4 million that Community Futures uh, provided uh, through uh, its, the um, business assistance program through COVID-19. And so those funds are the same funds that you hear businesses get in, at the bank. And so Community Futures, the federal government gave Community Futures uh, funds in order to manage that program. And all the Community Futures actually across Canada were provided funding through the federal government 
to provide a $40,000 loan and then a $20,000 additional loan for the businesses to help them through the, the crunch. And uh, I'm proud to say our Community Futures was in the top three for British Columbia in uh, distributing loans to, to our businesses. Our office was absolutely a madhouse because we still only had the same amount of people working. And actually, I was the one that put out that $4 million <laughs> and worked day and night, seven days a week. But boy, there was a lot of really thankful people, really, really thankful. And the numbers are similar of part about uh, you know the high risk. Uh, we have like 70% of loans are medium or high risk, and that still is true. And then 40% of them are uh, for startups and it was very surprising about the startups even through COVID because people were selling their businesses and uh, and other people were picking them up and uh, and it just, so the ones that were selling them were just trying to get out from under their debt and and uh, and uh, another business uh, entrepreneur would come in and buy it. It's sad that that business sold, but on the other hand, those businesses that, they, that, that, that bought the businesses, those businesses are still operating in our communities, and that's the important thing. We want to keep those jobs, and we want to keep those small businesses operating in our community. And so it was, it was a very interesting transition, seeing that grow throughout all the communities, very similar. Um, And then um, I'm going to send you uh, a, uh, a different report than this because it, it didn't transfer very well from our uh, PDF. But in general, generally speaking, what I was trying to uh, say here was that uh, our targets that the federal government wants us to meet every year uh, is in our region, they want us to, for business training sessions for participants, we have to reach 100. Uh, for business advis advisory services, we have, to, we have to reach 300. And then for the value of loans, we have to lend 400,000. That's the goal that they give us. Those are the, what, that, that's what they tell us we have to do, and we have to deliver eight loans. And, and the projects and initiatives, we have to deliver two projects. And our Community Futures Office has exceeded all our, all our uh, targets every year, year after year after year. Uh, like uh, 2014, 15, 1.9, almost 2 million. 2015, 16, 851. And then you go up to uh, all the way we're much more than 400,000 each year. And I had put uh, new numbers for you. And it's not gonna make it easy for me, I see. Here we go. Yeah, so for 21-22, as I said, uh, so, our loan values over the, like for 400,000 a year. And so then you take, you take five years and uh, you divide five, 400,000 five years, but you got $2 million. And, uh, and at the end of our, you know, over the five years and now, uh, and this is without the triple RF loans that I talked about, the 40,000 and 60,000. We, we have uh, lent five, $5,851. And so uh, we, we can do a lot with a little bit of money that we're getting from WD and Pacific Can. And that's what I wanted to stress. That was my reason, real my reason for coming because I hear time and time again uh, that uh, no one knows who Community Futures is. And who's that? What do they do? And, and it's because we're mostly working with the businesses. And the businesses don't shout it out. 
on, on what we're doing. Like, you know, not everybody uh, reports that, oh, I got my loan at uh, Community Futures and they helped me with my business plan and got me through this. And I had claimed bankruptcy and the banks wouldn't allow me, uh, they wouldn't lend to me. Or I'm a first year business, the banks wouldn't look at me. Uh, they don't tell their stories, but that is the stories, and there's a lot of them. And uh, so we really love what we do, that we can take these businesses that have gone to the banks and tried every way to get a loan and were unsuccessful. And then they can come to us, and uh, we work with them. And we don't always say yes, either. Like, we work with them because we go through their business plan. We look at what, they, um, uh, what they're trying to do. And we do the numbers. And at the end of the day, when those numbers are done, uh, it's not always a yes. And they raise their eyebrows too. Oh, maybe I'm not ready to do this right now. You know, so we save a few people as we go along. Uh, we did a, um, we don't have, Ch we, uh, Chantwin is in surrounding areas. We're trying to put the dollars uh, in all the communities. And obviously, there's not as many loans in that in the smaller communities as there is in Fort St. John and Dawson Creek. So the numbers don't look great. But when you look in the surrounding areas, they, they are there. <laughs> and, uh, and then we broke it out for uh, Fort St. John and Dawson. And so we have a, a website that you can go on and you can, you can, uh, you can start your business plan on the website. It has everything that you need in order to, to start a business. And these are some of the programs we have. The Biz Shift, it's a five-day uh, business planning program. Uh, we work with uh, Work BC. We subcontract self-employment program. And uh, there is an office in, in Chatwood uh, with Work BC. They, they, uh, and we work closely with them for the unemployed that want to start a business and they can uh, they can apply for the self-employment program, and that's a business planning program, as well as they can start the business, draw the EI, and not have to plan it. And so it kind of gives them that extra cash for a year. And then the Export Navigator is helping businesses to get the, to move their product to other places outside of BC, which could even be Alberta. It could be the Yukon. But we have a team through a Small Business BC and uh, Community Futures that works with, with these businesses. Uh, and then this is just a spotlight of, of some of our clients and uh, CCW Ventures. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they are a, uh, a, a company owned by three uh, young uh, First Nations uh, businessmen. And uh, they ha you can see that they got these bucket trucks and they, they work with uh, telephone lines, hydro lines. Um, at the time, we, we lent them the money to get them started. And we can lend, uh, out of our office, we can lend 150000 But if there's a business that needs a half a million, we go out to our other CF offices in British Columbia and pool the money, and we can get them that money to start. This is just a couple. Of you. I'm not going to read them to you. But projects. I just wanted to talk a little bit about projects, and then I'll I'll uh, let you carry on with your counseling. <laughs> so um, we were really instrumental uh, in the Tongue Ridge UNESCO Global Geopark. Uh, uh, I kind of had a, 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 a role uh, sitting on the, uh, the board of directors, the aspiring board of directors, and uh, on the New Zealand Society when, uh, and, and Prior to that, it was a dinosaur discovery gallery. Uh, Community Futures um, worked with the province and the federal government to get money to get that, the tools and everything that we needed for excavation and get that museum uh, up, and, up and running. And then uh, with the Tumblr Ge UNESCO Global Geopark uh, Community Futures, we, um, we did the master plan that was needed by UNESCO in order for the the, the Global Geopark to be uh, designated as a, a UNESCO Geopark. And so we were very involved in that. And, uh, and, and it's through relationships with the communities 
we had a big project in the Chetland uh, a few years back, and it was the Chetland Resource Center. And so the building, they had purchased the building and had modeled that we found the money for them in order to do all those renovations. And we ran a uh, business planning workshop through, uh, through, the, uh, through the provincial labor, I think it was called the Labor, labor Market Partnership Program. And, uh, and that was going really good. There were so many businesses that had started and had the marketplace. And uh, it couldn't carry on down the road, which was very unfortunate. But I, I have to say, it wasn't for the lack of hard work given by those women uh, that, that did that. They were, they were laying slabs of rock and cement and painting and hammering and digging. And they really worked hard. And uh, we were pretty excited about that project. And we're always looking for new projects, we, you know, and that's just through relationships. So we can't, we can't, um, like if you see something in your community that you, you know, or um, a non for profit you know, that is looking for help, point them our way and you know and we will work with them. Uh, yeah, so this is just talking about uh, the Northeast Aboriginal Business Center that we uh, we help them through projects. Uh, the Dawson Creek Art Gallery, uh, we we found money for them and uh, and then we also a lot uh, with non for profit they have tough, a lot of them don't have a um, audited financial statements, <laughs> and so they can't apply for this money. And so we look at their operation, and if we feel that they're working responsibly, and, and they can demonstrate that with just showing us their finances, we'll apply for the money for them under community features. This is what we've done several times. We, and we use our audited financial statements, and we take on the responsibility to make sure the projects run right, and that uh, the money that, that, that was granted is going to be used the way it was said it was to be done. And we help that organization through the whole project time. And so we take that, we even do their payroll. Uh, we did that with the geopark. Um, we did it with the art gallery. And uh, these, these organizations went almost from dust to, you know, really successful. And we're really, we're really proud to be a part of that. Uh, we ran the Ginger's Dragon Den for uh, three years. Third year uh, didn't quite work out because of COVID. And then uh, we started just doing things more virtual after that. And so we support our programs in the uh, uh, Sparks Women's Leadership. We've supported that for the last five years. And uh, we continue to support that. We support a lot of um, community uh, events. Uh, the the annual powwow that is held in Taylor. Uh, we support that every year. We support Nina's every year. And these are 2019 financial <laughs> statements. So anyway, like so, currently right now, um, we uh, ran a paramedic program. We're just wrapping it up. And uh, this was a free po program to bring uh, an individual up to the fullest paramedic uh, licensing that they can run an ambulance. And we did that through the community workforce uh, program through the, through the province. And uh, it was the Columbia Paramedic Institute that provided the training. And they were trained in Dawson Creek. And so 14 in individuals completed the program and 14 individuals left job. And so we just started a new program because of the success of that program. And we've started, uh, and there's 11 people signed up for that. So that's providing paramedics in the Northeast. Uh, to help with the lack of paramedics. <laughs> uh, any questions? So. Counselors? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor. Um, so, Sue, you said the um, the uh, community futures uh, they they supply grant grant support for nonprofits. Is that correct? We we ourselves don't have the grant money, but.
but we will look for the look for the money. Like there's different projects that are happening. Like there's money out there right now. You know, it could be um, a different. The provincial government, they, like with the real dividend funding, we we did proposals. I hired someone actually to do just proposals for the real dividend, and uh, and then it got the grant money for the non for profits. And uh, so there was like five real dividend projects. Um, some were a few years long. That's with the Northeast Aboriginal Business Center. And uh, so they were like three million, uh, or not three million, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 dollar projects. We did a HASCAP, uh, really. We tried to get a HASCAP uh, farming here in Chetland, and we couldn't get the funding because it was too closely attached to the school. But yes, we will, we will look for funding. Yeah, so if you know, you know, if they're looking like uh, the um, Dawson Creek needed a groomer for the cross country ski trails, and so they, we helped them with the proposal and then they got the funding. They got over 300000 to uh, to purchase a uh, groomer, for, and that was through the South Peace and Plains Trust. So that's an example. You know, if you can't write a proposal or you know you're you sound familiar, we will we will walk you through it and we will help you get that. Money to uh, just uh, on the uh teachers com is that the uh, our website. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the yeah, so that's why there's just too much to I need a day. <laughs> so uh, that's why I brought, brought your printed material. Go on our website, and um, and you'll see, you know, it's all laid out there. And and then go to the Taking Care of Business uh, work site. And uh, we are going to be in town. We got two people that have been working with businesses, calling the businesses to make sure they get that free training and coaching and consulting to the Taking Care of Business program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Go on the website. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, and can I have one of those too in my line? <laughs> <laughs> your carvings. <laughs> We're right across from the provincial building. It'd be an ideal location. <laughs> we'll have to discuss that. We will discuss it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. I have a couple reports. I attended my first Chamber of Commerce meeting 
last week and just uh, a few things that were brought up uh, we'll share so um, Chapman Trade Show March 31st to April 2nd as you probably already know I believe they are sold out but perhaps have one booth left so that's fantastic they also have Harvest Festival for scheduled for September 10th um, they've also added a page to the Chamber's website called Transitions for Canfor Employees. So Canfor Employees can find a wealth of information there if they don't have it. Um, membership for the Chamber is sitting at 143, so down two from last year, which is very good. And uh, that's about it for the chamber. I also attended uh, LGLA in Prince George last week, which is the Local Government Leadership Academy. LGLA is a leadership development initiative that serves local government and First Nations elected officials and senior administrators throughout BC by improving the uh, competencies needed to effectively manage and lead our communities. So this year's theme was uh, Traditions and Tides, Leadership in an Unchartered Frontier. Um, so just some things that stood out, it really emphasized being an advocate for our community and that we must network and get involved in other groups such as NCLGA, UBCM, FCM, things like that, they're very valuable. <clears throat> a keynote speaker was Ian McCormick. He is author of a couple of books, Who's Driving the Greater and Other Governance Questions, and The DNA of Great Leaders, and they can be found on Municipal World. Uh, they talked about codes of conduct for councils and boards. And in 2022, the province made the consideration to adopt or update a code of conduct, code of conduct within six months of taking office. A requirement for all local governments. So I don't know if we've reviewed our code of conduct yet, but I guess we have six months to do it from uh, election. Um, and it may not need to be updated uh, because I, I believe it wasn't too long ago that we did review it. Uh, we also looked at roles and responsibilities, the functioning council with Frank Leonard. Um, so uh, he emphasized you know, within the within the district, let the let the managers do their job. Um, <clears throat> a few other things he mentioned was um, working with the public. Don't become the problem. Issues are public issues. Don't make them personal. Um, and then, as far as feeling a conflict for any topic, if you if you feel conflicted, you should probably excuse yourself. Was probably the best uh, advice he could give, because if you feel it, it may it may appear that. very difficult for people to accept um, because property taxes are the primary revenue sources. Um, so taxi, as far as taxation and raising taxes, communication is key. Um, we got to listen to Christina Benti on asset management. So she's really passionate about asset management, refers to herself as an asset management evangelist. Um, so I guess her biggest question is um, how much time do we spend in maintenance versus proactive maintenance? And I think the District of Chapman does an excellent job in that sense. Uh, and it reminded me to reread the Joy of Governance. So if you, um, if any of the new counselors don't have it, um, they could probably get a copy through uh, Municipal World or Asset Management's website. A um, couple more things. 
uh, there was a presentation called More Than Halfway, More Than Half the Time. So this was a phrase that a First Nations from the province use, uses quite often. And Kevin Brown and former mayors Lynn Hall and Lori Ackerman um, use that as their opening more than halfway, more, uh, more than half the time when it comes to um, your, any type of effort. And they have, um, they, they gave a great report. Um, Lori mentioned some books that were really valuable and I have a list of them if anybody's interested in reading them. And just to just, you know, emphasized on attending events, getting together with our First Nations, getting together with our First Nations elders. Um, she mentioned that the new RCMP building in Fort St. John will have um, the name on the building in the Beaver language. And Lynn Hall says to show the for our local First Nations that this is a different, we are a different level of government than provincial or federal, right? We're neighbors, so we can, we have a, a much different relationship. And then the last one I attended was Civic Info BC and just a number to share the average municipal voter turnout in the province is 29%. So um, I think we were a little bit short of that, but it, it is the average, that's it. <clears throat> Questions? Just a couple numbers uh, that uh, they said if it was 50 50, uh, about when pro versus uh, reactive being proactive, 50% was a good number through communities. And when I looked at uh, when I was sitting in the same session, I looked at it, it says, he said, I don't have this time where I think of any time where the CAO has asked us that we need to increase this part of our proactive, like cleaning streets, cleaning uh, snow removal, or anything like that. I thought we were in a high percentile, past 70. And uh, when, when they talked about 50%, I thought, wow, if, if they're about that part about being proactive and reactive, our pro is way better than anything that, maybe there's other communities like that, but I, I've really found that it's pretty essential to uh, convey that to our staff, right? To uh, Steve and to all the managers. So that, that's quite important when we go out to other communities and we hear this stuff to uh, these uh, sessions that we go to. So it was quite important that when I sat there and I thought, I don't get that. I don't say, well, Steve or any of the come to us at, at council meetings saying we should be doing that. It's because I think we do a very good job at pro uh, being active in, in what we do in our in our business and gentlemen as counselors and as staff. So we got to thank the staff for that. We as council are uh, directors. We aren't doers, right? So the, the, this is very important for the, our staff. So it's something that Steve will kick back to uh, to the staff and convey that to the managers and the managers will convey that to the workers so that they understand that we went to these sessions to bring back this information from Council of Water. So anyway, that's, that's just one. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, uh, staff. If I could add to that, just before the meeting, I got noticed, notified by the TSBC that our Recreation Center once again uh, passed the uh, risk assessment program which means it impacts us in a huge way on how we staff and everything. It's, when I did it the last time, it was, I think it was right around 175 pages of technical data, staffing, safety, uh, all these kinds of things. And, and our staff, once again, were very successful in the process. Hardly anybody ever passes first time. This is the first time in my 30 years that I've seen anybody on their first, first inspection pass it. So wow. that's really good news. Yeah. Excellent news. All right. Any other? Uh, go ahead, Kyle. Okay. I we'll see so you guys up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I have an update from the Chippewa International Chainsaw Curbing uh, Group. They're still working on lining up the last two curb spots, although it seems like they have a couple of tentative tentatives, and um, they're they put it out to a, a couple other. They specifically one more international. 
Um, logs are lined up and the carvers will be getting a heads up on the approximate sizing since they are smaller than usual. They're going to be about 30 inches to 36 inches in diameter. Um, diameter, yeah. Um, and rather than the 36 to 50 inch logs that we've had in the past, um, so that the carvers will be prepared. <coughs> Um, they've confirmed two judges, Ryan Cook and Mark Paul. Uh, they'll be at the trade show with some new merchandise um, and will do, be doing a hockey fundraiser to try and raise some, some money. Uh, and there's only three months to go and things are plugging along. Thank you. Questions? Any other reports? Okay. We'll, uh, a motion to accept all reports as? So moved. Sorry. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Carry. Discussion, discussion item DI1, email from the Union of BC Municipalities dated February 14th, 2023. Councillor McDonald, Councillor Kirk. Yeah. I'll make that motion that Council ratify the re resolution adopted by email poll March 10th, 2023, to authorize two in two members of Council to attend the Union of BC Municipalities Housing Summit April 4th to 5th, 2023, in Vancouver. Okay, uh, discussion on that? I uh, This came a little bit late, uh, the BC government. Uh, and uh, UBCM thought it was very Im important that they have some kind of uh, summit or meeting. I guess they're, call they're calling it a summit because it was very important that housing is one of the things that's happening <coughs> in BC and the uh, provincial government uh, taking the lead on this. And uh, hopefully, they can't give, they, they, I want them to deliver, I guess. I hope they can deliver. But uh, it's important that all communities have a face at this summit. So uh, this is uh, quite important. But uh, for myself, I could not uh, attend because I have the most important job right now is to be in my community with the transition team. And if it was up to me and it wasn't the transition team and the closure of our sawmill, I would be uh, going to this summit because we need to have our people in place so that, yes, we will not be left aside because that's what happens in some of these sessions and uh, conferences. If you show that you're willing to participate, they seem to give you the, uh, the opportunity to participate. But if you do not show up or for lack of terms, not, not being there is not being seen or heard. So this is one of the things I, I really, made an error in my judgments of my meetings and I didn't have the opportunity to move a meeting which I did at the beginning and which I should have but this meeting I find is very important to our position in the housing uh, department of what we do here in Chapman what we do in other communities so that that's my uh, feel and I know we're busy it's the busy season I I agree to that because we all have uh, uh, jobs and uh, kids except the uh, retired <laughs> anyway, I would have went. So that's my discussion on that. Is there any anything to add to from council? Well, I I, <laughs> I have to say I assumed you were going. I was unaware of your conflict, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I agree. It's very important for somebody to attend, um, and I will relook at my schedule uh, in our parts. Uh, unless, it, do we know is anybody else attending? Mm -hmm. We, uh, at, at worst case scenario, we're going to ask Ellen to attend. Uh, the, his worship would like me to attend the transition meeting with him. We talked about yeah. that earlier today. Um, you know, it, it would be ideal if the counselor went, mm -hmm. but if 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 nobody else can attend, we'll find somebody in to, to attend. Any more? Okay. All those in favor? Carry. Correspondence. 
motion to receive C1 and 2? All those in favor? Okay. Information items. Motion to receive CII 1 through 15. Second. All those in favor? Carried. Reports for action, opportunity for the public. RA1, development permit, RA1 development permit number 11-2023-55648 Westgate Road, Van Carrier, uh, public comment period. This portion of the regular council meeting is set aside to allow the public comments on the application from Van Carrier for a development variance permit to allow locating a 30 by 40 uh, shop in front of his modular home on the property located at 5648 Westgate Road. Uh, we have a map, if all councillors have that in front of them. Yeah. Oh, okay. We don't have a map. <laughs> so anyway, that's up towards the cemetery, Westgate Road, if uh, people are asking. Uh, this is not a formal public hearing process, but rather an informal process. I will, however, ask each person who wishes to speak to state their name and residence residential or business address, and then provide council with their comments. I will ask now if there are any comments from the public on the application uh, from Van Carrier for a development variance permit on 5648 Westgate Road. Are there any comments? No public, any on the line? Okay, not hearing any. Uh, Hearing no further comments, I declare the public process concluded. Okay, we will continue to RA2, Animal Responsibility Bylaw Number 1158-2023. Sorry, Your Worship. Oh, we actually need to go back to Van Carrier Development Variance Permit, if you could, please, because oh, okay. we still need to, uh, we have a recommended motion there. Okay. On RA1 Council okay. Agenda Thank Report. You, okay, so we will back up a little bit and we will go back to Van Carrier with the motion or recommendation. I'll make the recommendation. Uh, that pursuant to section 498 of the local government act rs 2015 council authorized issuance of development variance permit number 01 2023 to allow allow the location of a 30 by 40 shop in front of his modular home on the property located at lot one district lot 1817 peace river district plan 14286 5648 westgate road chapel pc I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Okay, RA2. I'll make the recommendation that the an animal responsibility bylaw number 1158 2023 be introduced and read first, second, and third time. We have one, one addition to the move, uh, the motion, if we could, please. Uh, uh, our Cracker Jack editing team here noted uh, on on uh, 510, there is a typo where it says, uh, or make other no noises or that disturbs or tends to disturb the police, and that should read peace. So we would like to amend it to be introduced and read a first, second, and third time with the correction from police to peace on item 5.10. <clears throat> Do 
Is that uh, just a typing error or is that just a legal error? It's, sorry, it's, a, it's, a, it's gone through, I don't know, an entire team of lawyers, all the staff, everybody has missed it. So it's just, a, it's, it's a, the wrong word in the wrong place. So we're, so we're just correct. We're just correcting it, yes. It's not an amendment then, it's just a correction. Okay, okay, it's okay. a correction. Yeah, we're not amending nothing other than a, a correction. Okay. Okay. I'll make that correction. Yep. <laughs> yep, thanks for uh, recognizing that we need to correct. Okay, any discussion on that? Yes, go ahead, come through work. Okay, so um, have we ever in the past had a hen and beekeeping allowance bylaw? No, we have not. But we are getting more and more requests to have hen keeping and beekeeping. So uh, our bylaw officer, Marv there, has gone, spent a lot of time on this, researching other communities. It's, the wording is, is best practices for BC and has been really thoroughly vetted by our lawyers. <coughs> okay, so does that mean then that um, it, it is best, it, having bees and hens is in best practice in the province and we are, this is the recommendation? Yes, it's, that's correct. It's, it's, uh, it's become more and more of a trend. We first started seeing hen keeping and beekeeping probably uh, six or seven years ago, I would think, roughly. And more and more communities have adopted it. Uh, Taylor adopted it about four or five years ago, for instance, locally. Um, we get a surprisingly large number of inquiries about, about hens. Uh, the concerns are, and, and you'll notice in the bylaw, it's very carefully laid out. You can have a specified number of hens. You can't have roosters because roosters crow at the break of day and tends to annoy the neighbors. Uh, there's there's recommendations about cleanliness, about care, about all these things. So it allows our taxpayers to have the ability to have the hens without disturbing the peace of the neighborhood or adding any kind of health hazard. Thank you. And does this mean it, if this bylaw is passed, then my neighbor or your neighbor can go ahead and get the hens or the bees without any... Um, Permit or no? Actually, they're under the bylaw. They're they're required to register with with the the district of Chatham to let us know they're doing it, and then it becomes a bylaw officer's job to to monitor it. And I see her raising her hand here. Uh, I just wanted to mention that you know the beekeeping actually they have to register with the province. They're required to register. Okay, great. Just my last questions are. Um, do we know what issues have arisen uh, in the other communities, if any? So, um, uh, go ahead. Do you want me to get the mic? Yeah, please. So, um, there's not a lot of um, conversation with other bylaw officers regarding well, the hands. Uh, well, just for everybody's, uh, can you state your name and your for? I am Marv McKinnon, Bylaw Enforcement Animal Control Officer for the District of Chetwind. Thank you. Um, okay, so when it comes to the beekeeping and the hens, we really thoroughly um, looked at all of the different um, municipalities, and I've talked to the other officers. I'm in an association, and they're fabulous for giving us all the information. Um, and really, our biggest concerns really are cleanliness, um, and um, noise violations really at the end of the day. Um, so it will be, it will fall on me and I'm okay with it, kind of. I don't really like chickens, but um, I understand they give us eggs and they give us food, so that's fine. Um, but like it will fall on me to do uh, some of the inspections, make sure that people are following the reg regulations, um, and I will have to leave it somewhat up to our community to let us know mm -hmm. if there's a problem mm -hmm. of any kind. Um, and no roosters ever, because we've already gone through that a few times. Um, yeah. And so as long as there's no complaints and no concerns, 
Um, just go ahead and get your chickens. Thank you. So one of the things I've learned the, the last five years is that if you put a sidewalk down, you're going to have to maintain it. And I believe this is one of the things that if we're making uh, bylaws, we have to be able to maintain and meaning to maintain that's man or a person has to do that job, right? So we cannot be understaffed for these uh, things that we make at council and, uh, and I'm sure the problems with the beekeeping will be able to assist us in that matter. But when we do have, like we say, infrastructure and this bylaw is giving us opportunity to, for people to have ends and bees, but yet we have one bylaw officer. So let's be cognizant of that, that when we put down a, a sidewalk, we have to maintain it. This is just one of the things that has to be uh, looked at. We can't just say, oh, well, we didn't know. We know now. Thank, thank you, Mark. All right, any more discussion on that? Okay, call the question. All in favor? Here. RA3 uh, Lee Shook application for development variance permit 02 2023. Sure. I'll make a recommendation that. Uh, I'll make recommendation that pursuant to section 498 of the Local Government Act, RS 2015, Council of the District of Chetwin give notice that it will be receiving an application from Lee Shook requesting approval of a development variance permit application to allow for variance for size of a sign for his home based business, business at parcel A G26253, lot 15, district lot 482. Peace River Regional District Plan 10202, 5227 43rd Street, Chetwin, BC, and that administration be directed to advertise a public input opportunity with respect to the above application to be scheduled on April 3rd, 2023. Discussion? Buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there's no discussion. All those in favor? Carry on. All right. Reports for information. R I one. February accounts payable. I'll make a recommendation that the check register for the month of February 2023 to remain $594,064.99, please. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. No new business. Any public meeting question? Okay, adjournment. So moved. Second. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Council. Thank you. Amanda Tricker and I'm the Children's Program Coordinator at the Chetwin Public Library. And I'm Michelle Fontaine. I am the Youth Program Coordinator over here at the Public Library. We work together um, on the programming. Uh, Michelle does the after school care and I'm the zero to five. And we try and work as closely as we can to mm -hmm. make uh, our efforts in the community to bring people together. And we host a lot of different events here mm -hmm. at the Chetwin Library. Um, we, um, we're working on a Easter one right now, a family fun night. We had Flashlight Fridays in February, which went crazy good. Um, we, we just had our registration for a new program starting April 3rd, 
and they filled up so fast, which we are working on getting hopefully maybe some more in the works because um, we want everybody in the community to come together and be able to be a part of it. Yeah. And we want to be able to serve everybody of all ages, so having that opportunity to, co to connect with um, all kinds of you know, kids from all around town, not just one specific school, but from every um, you know, area in town is really important to us. And kids then can meet new friends, which is wonderful. People that they wouldn't have met you know, beforehand, which is great as well. So me, as the Children's Program Coordinator, um, we bring a lot of moms into the groups and we all connect as moms and especially with the way things have been going, moms get to come in and connect with other moms and they get to see and enjoy each other and talk about like being a new mom or having other kids and our struggles and things like that and I also have a lot of play date groups which are zero to five so people with uh, younger kids and older kids can come in and we can kind of amalgamate together and everybody can come in and enjoy do crafts and lots of sensory stuff. So as the youth program coordinator my main focus is school age children from kindergarten to grade seven so we do have a wide variety of programs that do that do cater to different interests of different age groups. So Monday and Tuesday, we do have the I have the younger ones who are kindergarten to grade three, and then Wednesday and Friday are my older children. So they're grade four to grade seven. So there is a big, um, you know, spectrum of what we do. Um, so Monday and Tuesday are mostly just a fun time. We do a lot of activities and we do a lot of um, playtime and games and things like that. Wednesday is more uh, science based. This this session we're going with more science-based science experiments for the older kids. Um, Thursday is um, crazy creations in which we are building and creating you know using our imaginations really it's it's a really you know free-floating kind of program we're trying something new this time around and Friday is our cooking class which is geared towards the older kids who have more skills in the kitchen and are more guidable than the little guys, so that's pretty exciting. We're really looking forward to that. So as far as the Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday program, we're already totally full, almost completely in those ones, because the younger ones, uh, they love coming out to play, but maybe people don't realize that we do have a lot of spaces left in our older classes, so if any of the parents wanted to come down and register their older kids, grade four to grade seven, for the Wednesday or, or Friday program, that would be wonderful too, as we have a lot of spaces available. We, and we'll also have a teen program coming in the works, that's something that our goal is to work on is mm -hmm. inviting the teens in mm -hmm. and Michelle will be working closely with them to provide all ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We also have free snacks available mm -hmm. for the programs that run during the day that are my programs and Michelle's after mm -hmm. school and we make sure that they're clean healthy snacks mm -hmm. um, and they can choose from whatever they want for that and in my programs I also feed the parents too mm -hmm. among with the kids. Yeah. So pretty cool. So we have a summer reading program that's coming up. Um, you can, if you don't know how to register, you can call the library or you can come on down and we can walk you through everything and we can also show you at all of our other resources. We have a lot of them um, and we can show you, we have like a pamphlet. You can also go online. We have a Facebook page where you can kind of scroll through and check out all the resources that we have and the times and programming for that. Uh, I want to thank you guys for listening to us today. Um, we hope to see some new families mm -hmm. in the works and some more new people come in and join us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we hope to see some new families. Mm -hmm. and we just thank you so much for endorsing our library. It's great to have all the faces come in and we love meeting new people and seeing the hustle and bustle in here is, is great. <laughs>
Welcome to our 50th Moggs and Flats Sesame Street 50th anniversary. What a great turnout. Beautiful day yesterday and today. As you can see, we have a lot of events going on with the organizers that did this event. Is people from everywhere that came, like Vancouver, Chilliwack, oh gosh, Killer Lake, Alberta. Grand Prairie, a lot of people, and a lot of us are related because we are all <laughs> did come from Moggleston Flats, and where I'm standing is where Moggleston Flats was. And I just, just behind me here is where we lived. And just like I said, there's a lot of all the families that lived in Moggleston Flats are here attending, and it's everybody's having fun. It's so great to see everybody I haven't seen for 20 years or so and thank you to the organizers Leanne McPeters, Adele Avery, Letha Dowd and Lynette Desjardins and Ruby Knott. They did a lot of work to, to hold this event and they did a beautiful job. For for people that don't know what Moggs and Flats was, is, this is where we lived. This is where we squatted 50 years ago. Um, we just lived in shacks. We had no power, no running water, no nothing. We were all pretty poor, but we all survived. I, don't, I myself don't remember ever being hungry because we had hunters and everybody shared. And yeah, so. In 1971, they uh, built Wabi Crescent. I guess they started in 1969. I'm going to say it took a couple of years to build the houses in Wabi Crescent. And that's where they all moved us to. And the houses were not free. We had to pay a mortgage and a dollar for the lot. So everybody here now is Marks and Flats and Sesame Street. So it's great to see.